Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of our Tech Connect series where we bring diverse and dynamic perspectives from all corners of the technology world through thought-provoking questions and conversation. And today is a very special episode because it has officially been one year since we released our first Tech Connect. We thought it would be the perfect time to reflect on the growth we've experienced in the world of generative AI and who better to do that with than our Chief Technology Officer, Joel Horan. And it's kind of amazing that it's taken a year for us to have that conversation, but welcome, Joel. Hey, David. I'm uh, happy I could finally join the Tech Connect series uh, in in very special occasion, indeed, to, to be here for my first time on the one-year anniversary. Uh, we've got a lot to, to cover and to recap on uh, everything that's happened since the first episode. So I uh, say we get started. Um, so, so, David, to start, the, the usage of generative AI has been really on a progressive rise over the past couple of years. Uh, and as fast as it started, it really feels like in the last year, there's been an even more rapid acceleration. Uh, the landscape of, of competition and many companies racing to become leaders in this field, including Thomson Reuters. So with everything that's taken place over the last year, uh, what do you see as some of the most significant advances in AI technology that, that you've observed? Yeah, and it's, I think it's a great question that, you know, I'm curious to hear your take on too, Joel. Uh, and there's been a lot of different advancements, but you know, I'd focus on a few just in the past year. Um, I think that one, uh, accessibility to all the genetic technology has improved tremendously over this past year. So I think the developer tools, as well as the reduced cost and sort of the out of the box capabilities now to do things like retrieval augmented generation has uh, again made it a whole lot easier for developers to get started. I know that uh, a year ago it was like who had the rare set of skills to be able to apply generative AI. I think now a year in, uh, there's a lot more engineers, a lot more technical teams that can apply it. You know, getting into the models themselves. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the marketplace, you know, around things like multimodal and long context and things like that, and I just think of this as a general theme that that the models keep on getting better, that they continue to impress and there's more and more capability. And, you know, uh, maybe just to zoom in on one, I'm particularly excited about the ability uh, for models to have longer context windows, which means that they have this longer uh, ability to, to keep lots of information in short term memory and answer uh, ever more complex questions. And that's critical for the way that TR uses a lot of these models. But, I mean, to that point, Joel, uh, with these developments, and especially the ones that TR, Thomson Reuters, has been part of over the past year, uh, what's to come from your take? What's, what, what are you excited about? What trends do you foresee in AI development and implementation for the coming year? And, you know, what in your view is speeding up or starting to plateau and slow down? Yeah, it's a good question. I think to your first point, you know, a lot of the technology uh, patterns of how to not just use, you know, large language models and generative AI, but really how to harness them for particular use cases, how to sort of mitigate the risks of hallucination, or at least minimize them as much as possible. A lot of these patterns have really developed and there's a lot of tooling that's available to make that more accessible across the board. And that, that really happened very quickly, over really over the matter of about a, a year or a year and a half uh, that we've seen. Um, and I think if you look at the core models themselves, a lot hasn't changed. You know, that it's not like we've made another step change from you know, like uh, a trillion parameters to 10 trillion parameters. And we've seen step changes in performance. We've seen the models sort of improve at the fringes, like long context, the agentic behaviors of the models have uh, become more robust in their ability to plan and to to use tools, uh, their ability to reason uh, over complex information has improved drastically. Uh, their ability to do things like math and, and sort of more critical thinking concepts have, have improved dramatically. So um, I think on the one hand, like the core models perhaps have slowed, but a lot of these fringe capabilities that make them more applicable uh, and practical to be used in a B2C or in a B2B context uh, have sped up and, and I think continue to mature in many ways. And I think that's something we will continue to see uh, o over the coming months and years for sure. You know, a couple of months ago, uh, Thomson Reuters uh, Institute released the results of, of our annual uh, Future of Professionals report, which found 
uh, really that an overwhelming sense of enthusiasm that, that professionals across several industries have for, for AI. And one of the things we uncovered was that Gen AI solutions, particularly for legal and tax and compliance sectors, uh, were among some of the most widely adopted categories of professional grade AI applications to date. Uh, so on the one hand, it makes me super proud of, of our teams, uh, both product and technology and, and other supporting functions uh, and the products that we've released that have addressed customers' needs in these areas, enabling them to, to save time and money while, while focusing on, on higher value and higher quality work. And so all this work takes an incredible amount of, of innovation, but also for these fields of work, accuracy is paramount, uh, as, as you know uh, very well, I'm sure. So how do you see us as Thomson Reuters balancing the need to go fast and to innovate, to, to be on the latest and greatest uh, with the need for, for ethical and responsible and, and high quality AI development? And you mentioned, you know, and you're you're sharing a little bit around the future of professionals' work, this idea about professional grade AI. I think that's one place that I start, and I've talked about this before. Where, you know, at Thomson Reuters, we believe that we're we're best positioned to create professional grade AI. And what we've spoken about on professional grade AI is that it is grounded, grounded in fact and data. That it is measurable, so you can understand the quality, whether or not something is at a 99% accuracy rate or a 90% accuracy rate, it makes a big difference in the amount of trust and checking you need to do. Uh, and then of course that it's secure and then private and ethical. Uh, so I think that, you know, is a, is a starting place that so we have uh, a philosophy and that we have principles around how we're thinking about the development of the product. And then of course there is then sort of the, the mechanisms and process where at Thomson Reuters, we have ethical and responsible AI principles, but we also have uh, a number of compliance processes to make sure that when we're developing our products, we take them through privacy review, model review, data use review, legal review, et cetera. And you know, that's something that a company like TR, Thomson Reuters, we're able to do because we have the scale and some of the infrastructure to do that. And so that also, again, I think helps us to balance that innovation. So, you know, we focus on the customer, understand what their needs are, try to deliver against their uh, biggest, hardest problems that they want us to solve. But we do that, again, with both a philosophy and a process that I think helps to strike a balance there. Let me switch gears. Before becoming our chief technology officer, you were uh, at the head of our Thomson Reuters labs team. And that team, it delivered a remarkable number of generative AI products. Uh, in last month's episode, I spoke with Leanne Blanchfield, our head of editorial at Thomson Reuters, and she referred to the accuracy and the rigor that goes behind our content and the human element incorporated into curating and bolstering the quality of that data. So in your in your work, how does our human-centric approach to AI development differentiate our solutions? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I'd say our human expertise at Thomson Reuters and the level of rigor and quality we put behind our content and and our products for years uh, has really been a, a cornerstone of, of our brand and our products for many, many years. And I would say AI and generative AI are uh, no different than that at all. Um, in fact, I think I think one of the you know most challenging things with with AI is from 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 a user perspective, most uh, users, whether they be attorneys, tax professionals, or or any other type of user. Uh, really doesn't care about the technology behind the application. They actually they don't even care that it's AI in the first place. You know, they, they just expect it to sort of work in the way they need it to, to, to facilitate whatever um, job or, or work process they're, they're trying to do. And so, you know, from an end user perspective, needing to understand a language model and all of its constraints and where it works well and where it doesn't work well and how it needs to be sort of prompted or interrogated to get to a right answer is not something that you know most people care to, to really learn and become experts at. And I would say that that is really, I think, the marriage of our technologists and, and our human expertise internally is to bring those two groups of people together to enforce how, how a tax professional or how a legal professional thinks about this problem with how the model needs to behave in order to solve that problem in a direct way. And that is really only done um, uh, through a process by which we can we can try things out on the technology side and have 
high quality uh, human uh, expertise, like reviewing and providing feedback on those answers in a very continuous and fluid way. And that's how, at the end of the day, we, we build great solutions for our customers. Uh, it is through a lot of hard work and a lot of hard yards gained through those those iterations between technology and, and domain experts. And I think that that's something that, like I said before, has been a cornerstone of, of what we've done for many years and, and is something that uh, is extremely important with, with AI as well. So, so David, while AI and tech has evolved over the past year, uh, Thomson Reuters has really embraced this change and has made tremendous investments uh, to help our customers streamline those workflows with our products and, and AI. Reflecting over the past year, our teams have, have been hard at work and a few milestone products really come to mind. Uh, AI-assisted research on, on Westlaw Precision, Co-Council Core, and, and the internationalization of Co-Council Core, uh, expanding to countries like Canada and Australia. Uh, we engaged in strategic AI partnerships with the National Center for State Courts and, and many, many more. So can you talk about, uh, from your perspective, some of the more momentous occasions for Thomson Reuters in, in the world of generative AI and what you've been hearing from customers throughout that journey? Yeah, and you, you named a number of the big ones already. Uh, but just to build on your previous point that you're, you're raising around the humans in the loop, I just wanted to you know, completely agree with that. And, and in particular, as we take on harder and harder problems for our customers, the need for subject matter experts that understand how that work is done becomes even more important because it's hard to be able to gauge the quality of work which is done by progressively more senior and more sophisticated lawyers. But back to the, the question around the momentous occasions, on top of the ones that you've mentioned, I think the one that I'm most excited about is the recent launch of Co-Counsel 2.0. And the reason why is because it has been the culmination of work that our teams, both the ex case text folks and our top orders AI teams working together over the past year to build a consistent single AI assistant for our customers. And so that's a vision we shared uh, earlier in 2024. We shared it in you know, about the March, April timeframe. And I'm really excited that we're, we're bringing that to life. Uh, and that means that it is a single AI assistant that is available throughout our applications, as well as in the standalone co-counsel web interface. And again, has a broad set of capabilities that is like, again, a member of your team you can delegate material work to. And so I think it's a great example of how our teams have been able to come together to do more. We've helped the co-counsel and the case that seems to grow faster to be able to deliver for our customers. And so uh, that I'm excited about. And customers, from what I've heard, are pretty excited about it too. They love the vision of this integrated single AI system. I think it brings together a lot of the strengths that Thomson Reuters has because we have this broad diversity of products, but our customers often said it's hard to find where to get started. Uh, we have so many different solutions that it's hard to, to discover what's the right solution. And CoCouncil helps to, again, remove that friction, helps you to point you in the right direction, help to show how our content, our software, how our AI can help customers complete uh, their work. And so again, it's a great example of how we've been able to work together uh, with uh, the Case Text, Case Text team. You know, I'm excited about what we're going to be doing uh, in other parts of our business. And so on that theme, this month, uh, we also announced the exciting acquisition of Materia, which is an AI assistant and platform which is designed for tax accounting and audit professionals. So the momentum really doesn't stop around here. So Joel, can you tell us a little bit about what this acquisition of Materia means for Thomson Reuters and what do you see as some of their differentiating technology that uh, we can bring to our customers? Yeah, so uh, I would say first, um, if nothing else, it is a reinforcement of our belief in AI assistance being in the hands of every professional. Uh, for one, I would say it's a reinforcement to our commitment around AI across our entire product portfolio. Um, but beyond that, uh, and, and specifically to Materia, I think to the conversation we were having earlier, like the models having evolved and their capabilities improving in certain dimensions like long context, uh, multimodality, agentic behavior. And, and I think Materia has done a good job of really leaning into these capabilities that have evolved and, and specifically 
around their use of uh, the agentic behavior of, of large language models. You know, uh, tax and audit really lend themselves to very workflow oriented tasks yes. and and um and the technology when used in that way is is i think really proficient at those kinds of skills and capabilities um but beyond the technology itself i think they really tailored into an experience that is purpose-built uh for audit professionals and tax professionals uh in that area and i think that's the the sort of last mile of technology delivery that's super important uh in in a b2b space and and certainly in a in a a a space like like in tax or in legal or otherwise uh is really tailoring how how that uh technology is used and how it shows up in the workflow and use cases uh that are being done in in that particular instance and i think the experience that that uh, materia have, have built in that is something that uh, we're really excited to to take and, and continue to build on just just like you mentioned we did uh, with case text and uh, the co-counsel platform as well so you okay. spoke about about case text and, and we just talked about materia and, and certainly uh, that momentum and innovation with this latest acquisition so we're, we're showing no signs of, of slowing down or, or taking our foot off the gas here so so my last question for you is uh, how you see Thomson Reuters playing a role in this competitive landscape. Uh, how are we going to supercharge the pace of our innovation through the use of generative AI beyond what we have already done uh, to date? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I, I probably could have asked the same question of you, Joel, <laughs> like, like, because I yeah. think the, that a lot of it is about the way that we work together um, between our product, our design, our editorial content teams, and our engineers and our data scientists and the technology teams behind everything we're building. And so it's, I know it's been a, a topic conversation we've been actively, actively engaged on. I think a lot of it has to do with, I think, our pace of experimentation uh, and making it so that we have more teams that are able to ship and to build uh, in all parts of our business. So another reason why Co-Council 2.0 and the execution around this fully integrated assistant, I think, is so important, is because in the in the back of all this, the technology underneath it, it allows more and more teams to be using one set of platforms and one set of technology, which they can all ship into. And that, I think, makes it so that we can have more people, more teams experimenting, and ideally, shorten the time that it takes to get from a customer idea into proofs of concepts and ultimately features, skills, and new capabilities within our Gen AI product. So I think that's one, just more experimentation, broader experimentation across uh, across our teams. I think the other thing that I'm really excited about is evolving the way that we work with our customers. There's been, at least at, at Thomson Reuters, a huge emphasis right now on our customer success and how we make those teams as much part of you know our customer success as it is our product and our technology success. Uh, I think that having a really tight loop between customer feedback and emerging needs from our customers to our product and our engineering teams is gonna be critical for the future so that we can, again, identify the right things to be innovating on, not only moving fast to, to execute and deliver. So just two, two broad themes that I would I would share on, again, that, that pace of experimentation and then the, the speed and the tight feedback loop between our customers and our, our product and engineering teams. Joel, we've, we've, we've talked about quite a lot today, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to have you on for our special one-year anniversary episode of Tech Connect. Um, I'm glad we could take a, take a look back, a little stroll down memory lane on our, uh, our accomplishments, uh, and I'm, I'm super excited uh, for the future that we have ahead of us. So uh, thank you again for, for joining us here today. I hope we can have more of these conversations. It's been fun. Uh, and to, to everybody listening in, thank you for, uh, for joining us and for following uh, the Tech Connect series. Uh, we will see you again soon on the next episode and for the next year and years ahead of Tech Connect and all the work we're doing here at Thomson Reuters. So thank you.